Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening and welcome to our uh, webinar series, uh, which, is, which is brought to you by the Kuala Lumpur team. Um, I'm Anand. I'm one of the VPs at the Chicago Malaysia Booth uh, Alumni Leaders Club. Uh, of course, we're here to talk about the COVID pandemic, which is having a huge impact in all our lives, uh, how we actually live, how we do business, how we interact with each other. It is changing in every aspect of our life. Uh, one of the things that we actually thought was how do we actually sort of bring all of these learnings and what we are actually doing on a daily basis to impact not just our lives, but our businesses as well. Um, uh, just a few house rules before we start. Um, uh, the session today, if you want to ask questions, there's a, a chat function and the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, which you can actually write your uh, questions and that will be answered at the end of the uh, end of this webinar. Um, and of course, for our uh, social media hashtags, you can use Chicago Booth KL webinars as the hashtag if you want to sort of tweet about something unique that you've actually learned or heard from the group here. Uh, Lenora, you can go to the next screen. Um, so why don't I give you a quick introduction to uh, our uh, speaker tonight. Our speaker is Arun uh, Rajamani, who's actually one of the principals at uh, Boston Consulting Group in Singapore. Um, born in India, he's actually graduated from one of the top, uh, uh, top uh, engineering schools in India called IIT Madras. I think you've heard of IIT Madras. Uh, and then I think he's followed his passion to do his master's with uh, Penn. He didn't stop there. He's actually gone and done another master's with uh, Chicago Booth. Uh, so those of you who've actually known him, uh, he might be your, um, your cohort for that group, uh, but he's an amazing guy. I think you should reach out to him and talk to him more as well. Uh, there's a lot of learnings that you can actually uh, learn from him. Uh, apart from that, he's actually one of the, currently he's actually a principal consultant at uh, Boston Consulting Group in Singapore. He has previously worked with uh, Dow Chemicals, FlowServe, just to name a few of the companies, uh, specializes in various sectors as payments, logistics, which I think is very important for us as to what's happening in the current, uh, this thing, data analytics, retail, uh, so, so many of those things. Uh, apart from that, uh, I also wanna sort of thank, uh, thank the uh, alumni team, uh, as well, Pedro, who's the president of the club in Malaysia, who's actually helped us quite a bit, Ali, Sulakshmi, who are the other club leaders who've also helped me in the background to put this thing together. Not to forget uh, CK from our Hong Kong team and Lenora, who've actually been working tirelessly to broadcast this to, um, uh, through the Chicago network as well. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Arun. Uh, and I think Arun will take over the session from here on. And uh, he has a few slides that he'll actually share with us. Arun, on to you, Arun. Uh, thanks a lot. Anand, so let me just share my screen here. So uh, hopefully everyone can see it clearly. Uh, so first of all, Anand, uh, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and also thanks to the broader alumni team for uh, giving me an opportunity to come here and share. So really appreciate that. Uh, happy to see, uh, happy to be in the midst of Bhutis again, although it's virtual. Uh, so uh, given the unprecedented times, we'll have to do with this virtual thing. Uh, rather than meeting at some bar in KLCC and talking about these things. Right? Uh, so first of all, uh, I really hope everyone is doing well in this time, right? I mean, well, as well as you can be. And I sincerely hope your friends and family across the world, they are all fine, right? I mean, this is quite unprecedented time. And uh, uh, so uh, I hope everyone is just doing well as, as well as you can, right? Now the title of today's discussion is where are we heading, right? Uh, so I don't have a crystal ball uh, to kind of predict where are we heading. I know there are a lot of opinions uh, that you can read all over about where we are heading. What I wanted to share here was a bit of perspective, uh, leveraging a lot of work that BCG has been doing on potential scenarios uh, that might play out and also giving some uh, uh, kind of frame for you to think about where we might be heading and what could potentially be the impact here, right? So the, the slides you see today, a lot of it is BCG content, uh, but I, am al I also have quite a lot of opinion on this topic. So I'll probably also share a lot of opinions, my personal opinions on this. Uh, so I please ask you to separate 
BCG slides and my personal opinions. So don't, don't always link them together. Uh, I could get in trouble with my company here. Okay, so just, just moving on. And I wanted to start with maybe something a bit, bit inspirational, right? So not sure how many of you are a lot of the rings fan, but uh, one of our uh, leaders, regional leaders actually began this as his first slide at a regional leadership meeting. And I thought it's quite apt uh, given the time. And it's also quite apt that it tells us, uh, we don't have a choice, right? It, we, we, we didn't have a choice in terms of circumstances that has been dealt to us, but we do have a choice of what we do and how we come out of this, right? So just wanted to kind of give you something inspirational to maybe start the discussion with. Now, in terms of the talk itself, wanted to focus today on three things. Uh, so quite simple, where are we today? I won't spend much time on where are we today because a lot of us are already abreast with the latest uh, developments here. Uh, where are we heading? So this is where probably I would spend most of the time uh, kind of giving some ideas on uh, 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 what scenarios might outplay and also what kind of uh, frameworks you can use to think about what the world might be in future. And then maybe wrap up with uh, some quick uh, insights on how companies can react. And here I can lean on uh, quite a bit on what we are seeing in the market as BCG, as well as what we are telling clients to look for. Right. So uh, now this might be from the frame of large companies uh, may not be relevant for uh, every type of enterprise, but I think there are some best practices which probably are transversal and can apply to everyone. Okay. So let me move on quickly. Uh, where are we today? And this one, I'll keep it short because most of you already have a good view of this, right? So, so as of today, uh, we are close to 5 million cases. And I just checked 30 minutes ago and we've crossed the 5 million threshold. We have about 325K fatalities. And as you can see from the number of countries, it's, it's crossed, it's actually even crossed 190 countries globally. There are very few countries which have not reported a case. Uh, with time, interesting trends have been observed. If I had shown this chart or map of the world a few weeks ago, you would have seen uh, the Western part of the world, US, Europe to be dark green and the Eastern part of the world, some of it might have been lighter green. But as you can see, the virus has actually shifted or at least the rate of growth has shifted more to emerging markets. So you're seeing faster growth now in countries like Russia, India, Brazil, and also Middle East now. Second thing is, as the virus engulfs the world, we are seeing the rate of spread is slowing down. So back in April, the virus was doubling every 19 days. Now we are almost up to 30 days. Uh, now this is bound to happen because the total number of cases have gone up, but also countries are getting smarter in terms of containment measure. And just to double click here, uh, on the left hand side, you can see countries which are showing the highest rate of doubling. Now this, uh, this data is a bit uh, delayed by a couple of weeks, but some countries like Russia, Brazil, India continue to show very fast pace of growth. Whereas at the bottom, you can see most of the Western countries have considerably slowed down their rate of doubling. If you were to plot this chart today, you might also pick up a lot of Middle Eastern countries. So Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Kuwait, they've also uh, recently spiked up quite a bit and they might also uh, feature maybe on the top, top part of the graph on the left hand side. Maybe I'll skip this slide and come here. Now all of you I know are very actively tracking the stock market. Uh, I see a lot of chatter on the Booth Malaysia WhatsApp group as well. Right? So you're probably kind of aware of what's happening in the market. As you can see, there are some winners. So we looked at year to date shareholder returns across different sectors. And as you can see, there are some winners. So there are some healthy sectors like pharma, which is uh, quite logical in the scenario, uh, food and household products, which is also something that you see more and more. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at the right hand corner or right hand side, you will see some sectors are quite stressed, right? Uh, energy sector, which is a sector where I work a lot, 
uh, unfortunately has been hit first by COVID shock and then a supply shock and is actually the worst performing. But even within each sector, you can see there's a widespread, right? So there are companies which still tend to perform quite well and differentiate from companies which are not doing so well. Uh, but overall, quite a gloomy scenario. You can see there is probably only pharma with a median uh, shareholder return close to zero uh, in this year. Everyone else is showing negative returns. If you are invested a lot in energy, you would see almost a 40% decline. Uh, in extreme cases, we've seen energy companies wipe out market cap that they raised over the last 20, 25 years. Right? So these guys have destroyed all value that has been raised since 1995. Uh, there are some extreme cases of companies. So quite, quite challenging time across all industries, but there are some sectors which we believe are healthier and will continue to stay healthier, right? which are things around pharma, software, uh, also more uh, uh, essential purchases, whether it's household products or daily goods. So let me actually jump to the second section. Uh, where are we heading? And spend some time here. From BCG perspective, uh, we see three distinct phases to this this whole episode, right? So there's a flattened phase, which which everyone has been in, or has has emerged out of, or is in the process of emerging, right? This was the the initial lockdown phase in most countries. About six to eight weeks in some countries, even longer in Wuhan, it was almost seventy days. So Depending on the situation, it was very different in different parts of the world. And then as we go from flat and we emerge into a fight phase. Uh, fight phase is the phase we are in and we believe this is a 12 to even 24 month phase. And this is a phase where the world is still not back to normal because the threat of vaccine remains outside. And the world cannot get back to full economic activity. And then you go into a future phase, right? Now you can see from the curves here, right? So you can see the economic activity taking a big hit in the flattened phase. Uh, we have seen uh, GDP projections or GDP for, uh, uh, results from China where it went minus six, minus seven from a plus six. So almost a minus 12, minus 13 contraction. The US reported minus four was supposed to be plus two. So almost a 6% contraction. Uh, some of these countries are not even reporting uh, in the first quarter, they're not even reporting the full impact of flattened phase because they began their flattened phase only in March timeframe. So, so the Q2 results of some of these countries will actually show the full extent of the depression or the economic contraction in the flattened phase. Then we go into fight phase and we can go a little bit deeper into what happens in fight phase. So two key things to, that will determine what will happen in the next phase, right? So first is how long the fight phase is going to be. Now everyone understands that till the virus is completely eliminated, life cannot go back to normal and there will be some sort of restrictions on economic activity. Now you could say three ways out of this fight phase, right? The most universally accepted is vaccine. So you have vaccine which is effective and scalable enough so that can be administered to everyone on the planet. There are different forecasts on this. As you know, usual vaccine timeline is five years. With global concerted effort, we are talking about 12 to 18 months. That's kind of the view. But there are some aggressive views. If you believe uh, President Trump, he feels there'll be a vaccine this year, right? Uh, so, so there are aggressive views, but if you talk, look at what the CEOs of different pharma companies have been saying, uh, it's a minimum of 12 to 18 months. So this takes us at least till summer of next year. Uh, treatment can help, uh, but what we have seen as of now in the market about treatment is most of the drugs are still six months away and there is no universal fix. So treatment might fix certain conditions in certain types of patients, but not necessarily fix it for all. So that's an option. And the third thing which would get us out is herd immunity, but most people already believe this is uh, kind of uh, not a practical solution. 
although we've seen some countries like Sweden actually trying to experiment with this. Uh, we don't know how it will pan out, but overall we think the fight phase is 12 to 24 months. Now, one thing to note is some companies, some countries are a bit more optimistic, bit more bullish on this. But what we've been telling clients is this is a long fight. And the sooner you accept it and adapt your operating model and business, the better you can emerge, better you can do in fight phase and the faster you can emerge out of the fight phase. So what would be the economic impact across the different phases? One way to analyze this is we looked at how do I break down the different contributors to your GDP? So we looked at different sectors and said, which sectors are more essential? So which sectors are more essential and has to stay open? And which sectors are ones which are most impacted with stay at home orders, right? We also looked at which sectors require more contact intensity, right? So for example, uh, software work remotely doesn't require contact intensity, uh, but uh, a movie theater requires a lot of people in a very close proximity and deals with heavy contact intensity. Now, why is this breakdown important, right? Because if you look at this breakdown for your country, you can almost do a back of the envelope calculation to impact of this on the economy. So for instance, uh, if I take Germany and say, which has probably the least amount in red, right? It has less than 10% stuck in tourism, restaurants, and all kinds of hospitality and high contact business. And then you argue and say, look, in the flattened phase, maybe 70% was uh, uh, contracted or 70% was not functioning. But in the, uh, in, the, in the fight phase, maybe it's 50% functioning or maybe it's 70% functioning, right? Then you can already apply the math and say, look, 30% of Germany will not work uh, in the 30% of tourism and restaurants will be down, but this only contributes 10% of my economy. So net net, there's about a 3% hit, right? So each country's starting point will be different. Countries like Brazil, Thailand, uh, which have a much higher share of tourism, leisure, restaurants kind of industry will have a higher impact versus countries like Germany, which have a much lower share in the red, uh, will see a lower impact. Right? So this is one way to start thinking what might be the potential impact uh, in the next phase. Now, of course, there are a lot of economic forecasts uh, around, right? IMF has continued to update its economic forecasts. All the big banks are forecasting as well. Now on this chart, you can see on the left-hand side uh, or the left column, the 2020 forecast. So the baseline was what IMF said back in January 2020. The red dot represents what IMF has said in their latest report in April 2020. And the spread there is just a range of what banks are telling, right? So you can already see a huge change in what IMF has projected in January versus April. Um, so if you take a large economy like US, that's already going from two to negative six, right? So that's already a negative eight percentage contraction in 2020, right? Countries like India, uh, which were projected to be a much higher rate, still stay positive growth rate, but again, uh, it's barely hitting 2% in some cases. Now, when you shift from left to right and you go from 2020 to 2021, you start seeing that the same IMF projections are now much more bullish uh, for these companies, right? So you can already see what they projected in January versus what they're projecting in April, a big change in growth forecast for these countries. Now, everyone is expecting a big rebound next year. Uh, I personally feel that the 2021 forecasts are a bit more bullish. Um, uh, my personal view is it's a foregone conclusion. It's not a V-shaped recovery, right? It's a U-shaped recovery. And the rebound is not going to happen till maybe 2022 or later, right? Uh, I would like to be proven wrong, uh, but uh, I think a more realistic view for me is that 2021 also is not going to be a year of big rebound. But again, there are a lot of uncertainties here. So who knows uh, the Moderna vaccine, which goes into trial now works and maybe, maybe things look rosier in 2021. 
uh, one quick note here. Uh, I shared my personal view, but I also want to share a view of what most investment managers in US are looking at right now. I know the topic of where stocks are heading is, is, a, is a big one. So what BCG did was we polled investment managers across US, which have greater than $4 trillion in assets overall. And we poll them, we poll them every other week to see how the views are progressing. A couple of things to highlight. You can see on the left hand side that only 9% now believe this is a V-shaped recovery, right? So you can see it's a, it's a foregone conclusion that there's no quick rebound. S&P, which uh, to me, uh, in some case beats the logic. I still don't know how it is, where it is. Uh, but we also know that there's a lot of free money floating around to keep the market up. But even here, you can see analysts have revised forecasts down and a lot of people believe that in Q3, we should hit a floor around 2300, right? So even here, we expect uh, some changes. And in fact, if you look at longer term, people expect even three years from now is only around 3600 range, right? So if you take uh, uh, re annual rate of return from now till there, it's only about 9% returns, right? So it's definitely not a quick rebound, uh, which maybe a lot of people or a lot of even political leaders in the world are thinking. I think it's probably a bit more optimistic if you believe it's going to be a quick V-shaped rebound in this world. Uh, but all is not negative. I just wanted to share a couple of uh, indices that we track in China to see how China is emerging. Uh, of course, China is the one which first went into lockdown, is the first one to enter the fight phase. Now, if you look at some key metrics, right, whether it's coal consumption, whether it's level of property transaction, uh, whether it's congestion traffic in China, or even if it's metro passengers, you can see that in a lot of cases, these have returned back to 2019 levels. So it's not growing, but at least it has returned back to 2019 levels. In case, in case of coal consumption, for instance, it's much higher today versus 2019 levels, right? So these are all very positive signs. Uh, it's also because of the fact that China was the first one to emerge out. And also the spread in China was very heavily localized in Hubei uh, versus other parts of the world, like the Western world, where it's uh, spread is quite uh, decentralized across the country. So maybe this speed of recovery may not happen in other parts of the world. Now, having said that, we still notice in China a phenomena where the weekday traffic metrics look good, but if you start switching to weekend metrics, they don't look as good. So what I mean is people are happy to travel to work. So on weekday, you see high traffic on metros and public transportation, but weekend that drops 50 to 70% which means people are not willing to go out and uh, for leisure activities, right? And this is going to persist throughout the fight phase till the fear of virus is eliminated. You will see that people uh, kind of being very judicious about the discretionary activities they do, whether it's going to a bar or a restaurant or traveling or getting on a plane, but in some form uh, still going on with the economic activities, right? And so you will start seeing a big disparity between weekday and weekend uh, public transportation and other indices in this case. Now, one way to think about where the world is going is, is to look at scenarios, right? Now, as I said, we don't have a crystal ball of what the trajectory would be, but in a time of uncertainty, which is time like this, the best way to think about world is in terms of scenarios of what might play out and as a company as a government what we advise people is to start thinking how these scenarios will impact you and what actions you can start taking in in each of these scenarios right now some scenarios can go extreme but still if you start thinking about what are the 10 actions i will take in each of the scenarios and then if you start seeing which actions stay common across all scenarios then that gives you idea that this is a very resilient action that I should play out, right? So that's kind of the logic in, in scenario thinking in some sense. The scenarios that we see for world uh, can be simplified around two axes. 
Uh, and these are more, um, these are common sense axes as you would think, right? So one is, what is the spread of disease, right? So one is, by end of this year, it's fairly contained, things look good, versus if you go down the axis, that it's still widespread, still causing a lot of trouble, right? So that's the Y axis here. The X axis is more around how governments will respond to this, right? So on one hand, on the right hand side, you could argue that governments globally are collaborating. Uh, they are quite cooperative and things are moving well, right? Whether it's, it's in terms of vaccine production or technology or in terms of measures that they pass. On the other extreme, so if you move to the, to the uh, left end of the X axis, there could be a scenario where the world starts disconnecting quite a bit, right? So one is world countries don't pass enough measures to get, the, get us out of this. So not enough stimuli, for example, not enough money into the system. They don't have the right measures here in terms of lockdown, easing of economy. They open too soon, cause a lot of widespread. And in some case, uh, it's a big risk of whether they become disjointed. And as you know, there were already global trade wars or at least uh, dark clouds of trade war, right? And this could even get worse. Uh, just this week, we've seen US take a very strict action against Huawei, uh, almost threatening the whole semiconductor and the technology sector in China, right? Now we have to wait and see how China responds to it. But if you take an extreme scenario where the big superpowers start uh, putting out very aggressive measures, uh, then this can actually cause a lot of problem, right? And this is kind of the scenario on the left hand side. And if you look at this axis, then you go into four scenarios, right? So I, I won't go into all four, but ideally we want to be in the right hand top corner, right? So we want to be in the top down prosperity scenario. Uh, this is where there is a global concerted effort, the virus dies down and the world goes into a strong recovery. Now, one thing though, in this recovery, we may still emerge out of this uh, with a world of haves and have nots. So we expect inequality to increase coming out of this, as you would imagine. Uh, partly, we also see some countries will emerge much stronger than others. So if you imagine one of the key measures that countries are using now is to just print money, right? And they will put a lot of debt and come out of this. Now, some countries like US, uh, which has very high ratings, can keep printing money, keep pumping trillions of dollars to emerge out of it. But if you are Venezuela or South Africa, you can only print so much money uh, without completely collapsing your currency. So some, some countries are in very heavy risk. Uh, just today, we saw Argentina now declaring to IMF that they may have to default on their latest payment coming up, right? So, so countries which are at risk, debt risk, may have difficulties emerging strong, but countries which can print money will probably extend their lead over others. So that's something to watch out in this top down prosperity. The bottom left protracted turmoil is a scenario which nobody hopes comes true, but it's also a case where you might see a very fractured world emerging out of this. So we are talking about a very low growth world very low, uh, very uh, localized supply chains. So this could be a world where countries stop, stop trading with each other. And this can lead to breakdown of some of the global supply chains and companies start becoming more locals. So instead of having large MNCs with footprint across the world, you might start seeing local champions. Uh, this is also a world where you would imagine oil price uh, never recovers, right? Uh, our forecast in this scenario would be that even in three years down the road, oil price is about $15. Uh, so this is a scenario where things can actually look quite bleak, uh, but we hope it doesn't come true. But again, we advise clients uh, to kind of plan for these situations. Now I'm just cognizant of time here, so I'll, I'll, I'll speed up a bit uh, to have some time for Q&A. Uh, just one, one, one point of note here for each scenario, we do look at how GDP will look at uh, GDP will uh, grow, 
how trade will evolve, how oil prices will evolve, what interest rates would be. And I think these are some indicators that can actually give you an idea of where the world is going. Right. So if you start seeing uh, global trade never recovering, more and more tariffs being used, you know you're heading towards the left, you're heading to a scenario where uh, you may end up in turmoil or maybe even stamina in concert. Right? And likewise, if you start seeing uh, price of oil recover fast, uh, because it's typically a leading indicator, uh, you can see where we are heading. Right. So, so what we advise people is to keep looking at some leading indicators. Now, some of these uh, are still quite macro and high level, but for each, uh, you can actually go down and within geographies look at a multiple set of indicators to look at which way the world might evolve in these scenarios. Uh, Arun, you can go until 645. I'll reduce my uh, closing for a short, uh, for less than a minute or so. Okay. Excellent. I mean, excellent. Got some really, I mean, interesting facts. I don't want to sort of uh, uh, people to feel that it was cut short. I think you should take the time to sort of uh, go through them, you know, for everybody's. Benefit. Okay. Okay. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, great. Th thanks a lot, Anand. So maybe let me move to how we see companies should react or what we are adv advising client. Now I know the, where are we heading section, uh, had a lot of lot of materials on future projections and how we see world evolving. Uh, happy to discuss more on the second section also in our Q and A. Um, so maybe let me just quickly uh, give some ideas of what, what we see companies are doing because that also gives you a view of uh, where we are heading in some sense. Uh, so first thing, what we see is as countries emerge out of the lockdown and go into fight phase there is no common approach that people are taking. Each country is on its own. Each country has a different plan. So Singapore, for example, came up with a plan yesterday with a three phase opening up of the economy. US, for instance, has left it to the states. They have given guidelines on what you can do when you open up, but it's completely up to states on what to do, right? Uh, other countries like UK have extended some of the stringent measures, right? So one at a government level, there's already no consistency on how to open up. Then on that, you add the second lens, which is how are companies opening up, right? Because government directive is one thing, but then companies have to make individual choices. And that adds a second level of complexity because even here, uh, different companies are doing differently depending on their uh, threshold for risk, depending on how much cash or how much liquidity they have. So you will see very different actions emerging across countries, but also companies as we go into this phase. First things first, I think we need to think people first as we emerge out of this. And when you look at big structural shifts that's happening for companies, right? From a people, people aspect, uh, there are six, six things here, but maybe let me just talk about two or three highlights here. So one, in the first phase, companies were looking at, okay, how do I do smart work? Uh, this was quite simple. They said, okay, six weeks lockdown, everyone just logs on to a WebEx and work goes on usual. But as we go to fight and even beyond, it's not about just smart work, but it's thinking about how do I work remotely for next 18, 24 months? And that has a big implication on the company, right? Because uh, one is basic stuff like having the right tools, and infrastructure to do it. But now, can I also take this to an advantage and optimize my cost? Uh, for instance, if 25% of my people will never come back to office, do I start releasing the leases I have? Do I free up uh, rental cars that I have for my employees? Right? Do I uh, make my cafeteria or food contracts different? So there's a huge implications on how companies can think about next 18 to 24 months in terms of smart work. Second, uh, in the flattened phase, I mean, everyone got into this mode of having sanitizers, measuring temperature and stuff. So this was kind of a knee jerk reaction, which was kind of uh, necessary. But now companies need to evolve into thinking longer term on not just physical health, but mental well being of clients. And the next crisis, a lot of people think would be as we emerge out of this is how do people manage remote work, working from home, employee morale, and companies who pay attention here. Um, will actually find 
higher productivity coming out of their employees. Uh, there are some cases where companies are more advanced and even thinking about, do I even have a contract tracing app for my own employees, right? So this can be built on what the government is doing or I build my own contact tracing app where I immediately know uh, when, when an employee is infected, who was next to him, how do I immediately act? And, and there are some companies which are already thinking about this. Right? Maybe last thing here I would say is on, on number three, in the flattened phase, which was the lockdown phase, we didn't sh structurally shift what employees are doing, right? Everyone just went home, opened up their laptops and started working. But as we move to this fight and future phase, uh, this is gonna be a long drawn fight. And the work we do will change. How we do will change. The skills required for that will change. And companies need to really start thinking how do I retool my employees? How do I reskill, upskill my employees? Companies where there have been a lot of downsizing, how do I uh, cross skill my employees and move employees across different, different activities? And this is gonna be very critical and companies which can think 18 to 24 months in advance will be better placed versus companies who are just hoping uh, life goes on normal, it's the same employee pool, same skill set, and we, we kind of move ahead. Uh, maybe one last point as, as everyone already understands there will be a very big acceleration of the whole digital agenda coming out of this uh, it, it's a no-brainer uh, uh, and covid probably has done more to digital transformation or will do more to digital transformation than what cdos in companies have done over probably five ten years right i mean this is a this is a fantastic opportunity to really accelerate the digital agenda within the company and just to give you a couple of examples, right? So people are already taking a look at this and taking drastic actions. So, I mean, my friends in Malaysia, we've already seen PNB make a very big announcement, right? That people can work from home permanently. Uh, we'll have to see how long this stays, right? Uh, when things go to normal, will this change? Or uh, this is something which becomes a norm. Uh, other companies globally like Twitter, have also mentioned this, Facebook has told its employees, you don't have to come back till December. So a lot of companies are really looking at this option. On the left-hand side, you see an example from uh, TCS in India, and this was a very bold one, right? So TCS is one of the largest IT employer in India. They have almost half a million employees, and they have this plan called 2525. So essentially what they want to do is by year 2025, only have 25% people working in offices. So 75% of the workforce actually may not even need an office. If you think about this, this has massive implication, right? When you're talking about a company of half a million, 75% uh, employees you can see is, is more than 350,000 employees working from home. And TCS is a big leader in IT, right? So others will have to follow suit to be competitive, right? So this can completely transform the whole ecosystem the IT economy in India. And the way TCS has projected this, they see it as a big positive. So one is of course, there's a huge reduction in non-personal costs, right? Whether it's rent or food or services associated with this. But they also see this as a big boost to productivity. So in most cities where employees travel one hour, two hours for traffic, that doesn't have to happen. And secondly, they feel by doing this, they will start attracting a segment of population which they were not able to attract before, right? So folks who had stuff to do at home and were not able to just leave their home and be outside 10, 12 hours a day. Right? So a big positive, I think fundamental shift is coming in how companies will work. And that will bring a tsunami of shift in terms of everything, right? So for example, if this happens, uh, how does the future HR work? How does the future IT work? Uh, every support function supporting a company will have to shift. Every company in a B2C business will have to start looking at how do I serve my employees? Uh, do I become more omni-channel? Do I go more offline to online to serve this work from home population? So you can just imagine the, the tsunami of shift that can come if all of these changes actually come to fruition. Maybe last thing on what companies are doing, and I'll keep this really short. Uh, we've already spoken about 
some of the actions. So I've, I've listed here uh, nine particular actions that companies are doing, but some, some actions uh, are critical now more than ever, right? So uh, besides cash cost liquidity, which everyone knows, is how do you make sure you still can protect your top line? How do you make sure you can still protect your customers? Do you have to go out of your way to make sure you keep your biggest customer, whether it's giving them a longer cash cycle to get them through the situation, whether it's offering things that you may not already offer, but actually can add to your portfolio to keep the customers. So number four here is something which is getting more and more critical as people are looking at how do I really protect my top line. And then the second thing, uh, more so also in Malaysian context, we see number nine is getting more important. So I do work a lot with the large GLCs in, in KL and all of these companies now see almost like a national calling, right? How do I get the whole Malaysian economy started? How do I help grassroots level organization? How do I help community activities? Now, some of these does take effort. Uh, they are not necessarily NPV positive or IRR, great IRR projects, but these are more nation building activities. Uh, but these could pay longer term dividends in terms of CSR shareholder trust in, in, in these companies, right? So a very clear directive on where we think companies should focus over the next uh, six months to 12 months. Uh, there are nine very specific actions for them. Maybe I, I am close to end of time. So maybe let me just finish. So I started the presentation with something hopefully inspirational. So let me also end or try to end. Uh, with something inspirational. Uh, there's a famous quote from uh, the legendary F1 driver, right, Ayrton Senna. And he says, you can't overtake 15 cars in sunny weather, but you can do when it's, it's raining, right? And again, this is, this is what we see for companies to think, how do I emerge uh, from this much stronger than how I went in and use this crisis actually to create a differentiator, right? Uh, we sometimes say, tell to people, uh, never let a good crisis waste. So I'm, I'm bang on 645. So Anand, maybe I'll just stop here. Uh, I rattled off a lot of stuff quite quickly. So maybe I'll take some time to clarify things where I might have gone too fast. No, no, I, I think it was really good. I mean, um, one of the points that you actually mentioned about uh, the digital transformation in a lot of the companies. I mean, I work in the healthcare sector. Uh, so we've actually done a lot of installations for uh, enabling uh, telemedicine based uh, services in the last four mm -hmm. weeks. So we've actually deployed yeah. hospitals are now saying, Hey, we want this service now. So in the last four weeks, we've yeah. actually accelerated. So I see mm -hmm. there are more opportunities that are coming out in certain sectors as compared to the other. Um, and in a way, I think it's also sort of, I call it the cleansing period where uh, certain sectors are being cleansed of, you know, naturally, you know, it Certainly. gets off all of the other uh, things as well. Um, anyway, the, that's my part. But I think there's some interesting questions that are uh, also here. Okay. So <laughs> wants to know where are the stock markets heading? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, on this one, uh, guys, if I knew where it was heading, uh, I wouldn't be doing this job. <laughs> I would be just sitting home and buying stuff. No, but I think uh, more more question would be like, do you see uh, based on what you've actually collected in terms of um, uh, some of the responses from your, uh, you know, every weekly calls or weekly polls, do you see an optimism in that or do you see something different? So I would say one thing. So let me just uh, open up the view we had put from our industrial survey, right? So, oops. And also to uh, the rest of the guys who are listening, please do type the questions in the, uh, in the Q&A session. I mean, I think we've also have about eight questions there. So I think it's just, uh, please type in, you know, uh, anything that you want to sort of uh, uh, know or understand. I think this is a good time to sort of do that. Um, so from our point of view, uh, we do think this recovery will take some time. Uh, so it's not something where you would expect a, a quick rebound. Uh, definitely not this year. Definitely not uh, early next year as well, right? This recovery will take time. In fact, the base case, uh, BCG assumption for the fight phase is 24 months. So it brings us to early 2022 uh, in some case, right? So you could imagine till early 2022, we will be in a world of protracted growth, which 
actually directly has an implication on stock market, right? And which should have an implication on earnings. Now, of course, uh, I personally feel the stock itself has been very disconnected uh, from the fundamentals. Uh, no amount of bad news is able to bring it down because uh, quite frankly, interest rates are zero. There is a lot of free money floating and people have nowhere to go, right? So it comes back into equities and it's pushing it up. So to be honest, uh, given this scenario, it's very hard to predict, right? If you just purely look at fundamentals, market should go down quite drastically. Uh, maybe, maybe the Q2 earnings in US uh, will probably bring some reality. I think the Q1 still actually didn't factor the impact of COVID because US actually only started probably late March in terms of lockdown and stuff. But maybe post Q2, once people see the earnings, hopefully the market shows some changes. Uh, but again, as a company, we don't get into the stocks, right? We are not at all linked uh, to the markets. We are just advising companies on their own long-term growth. I'm just sharing my personal view here. And my personal view would be that uh, uh, I would expect it to see much lower than where it is right now. Right. Uh, I think the next question, I sort of want to combine a co combination of these questions. So I think one is a second wave of infections. Uh, and also the intensity of the different uh, strains and how death rate statistics would be would change with COVID. Uh, yeah. Does BCG have any kind of uh, inputs or any kind of market uh, knowledge that we that you're you're allowed to share? Okay, so uh, one thing I would say is in terms of uh, death rates and stuff as a, as a policy, BCG doesn't look at that or forecast death rates right so so we don't we don't actually look at that factor right uh, my personal view uh, again this is personal view is the mortality rate globally is much much lower than people think it is and the reason for that is heavy under reporting of cases if i look at singapore where i'm sitting uh, we are almost 28 29000 cases and 22 deaths right so that's almost 0 0.06 percent. Right. Uh, if you look at Qatar, which has almost 30,000 deaths and 50, sorry, 30,000 cases and 15 deaths, uh, which is almost 0 0.05 percent mortality. Now, of course, each of these countries have a particular factor about the demographic that is being affected, uh, but that kind of gives you a view of how low the rate could be in some cases, right? Um, so no view on that. In terms of strains. Coming back, uh, again, there's no clear view on this. As of now, uh, people, ha we haven't seen research which says there are multiple different strains and it's very hard to build a vaccine. Uh, the, the risk, there was an earlier risk of mutation and seeing multiple strains and becoming out of hand. That so far has not been observed. But again, so much is unknown with this virus. My personal view is, Second wave is bound to happen. Uh, I mean, as long as country, if, if countries stay responsible, second wave won't happen. But if everyone goes lockdown over, we flattened, life goes back to normalcy, a second wave is bound to happen, right? right? And also keep in mind, we are in a situation where international travel is locked down completely. So countries as an isolated unit are containing it, but at some point we'll have to open international borders and that brings a whole new risk uh, back into this game. Right. Okay. I mean, I also was reading on Bloomberg uh, business yesterday that um, the China has just locked down another province for about 110, 100 yeah. million people. So yeah, that's exactly. to avoid any kind of rebound. So coming back to the ch question on China. Uh, so there's a question from Mark and Bamsi. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, there's a few questions here, but uh, Mark particularly has a question as to saying that the graphs that you've actually shown show uh, much better uh, uh, positive graphs as compared to what he's listening to from China, uh, from his factory managers in China. Uh, yeah. The other one combined to that is uh, whether it's going to be a U or a V recovery from Wamsi. Yeah. Uh, and I think the last one combined to that would be what is the, uh, how will the trade war between US and China affect Latin American countries? Okay. So maybe the first and second question, I can answer. The third one, uh, I may not be able to provide much view given given my lack of uh, knowledge about Latin America. Uh, Fair enough. 
so the first question uh, in terms of chinese recovery so uh, we have been tracking this indices for a while um, and at least from an industry standpoint uh, we have seen recovery right so you can see the amount of coal going into china now uh, coal consumption by power plants had dropped almost uh, down 80% if you look at coming out of chinese new year right in the graph here and you can see there was a huge huge drop in coal consumption but as you can see they had uh, kind of taken away uh, sorry they are not uh, built up any inventory during this point because of closures and border control and they have actually ramped up quite a bit coal purchases and coal demand in industry so so this is kind of a live tracking of the indices right now you are right that not all metrics look good right so i skipped over one slide here uh, during my presentation anything which to do with consumer uh, consumer related stuff uh, or b2c environment the metrics actually don't look good right so even as of now domestic travel is only 30% of what it would have been last year right so you can see most people are just not flying right there was a big chinese holiday uh, in may right recently and even during this visit more than half of the people actually just decided not to travel right so so anything to do with the consumer segment the indices look quite bad but from the industry sector uh, we do see uh, trends uh, going back some of it uh, for example things like property transaction and stuff uh, it's also pent up demand uh, so you would expect a natural recoil right things were shut for two months uh, they have to happen so all of them were back end or backlogged and they just all appeared in may or april uh so maybe going forward they don't keep the same pace but there's some kind of a recoil seen in some of these indices right um so i guess uh, we you know we're talking about b2c so there's a question from jim what will happen to the travel and tourism uh, sector post covid so i think this is the, this is the toughest one right so you can imagine um uh, here uh, just from the announcements right so yesterday emirates announced that it's are downsizing one third of its workforce right so out of 105000 people uh, 30000 people are being let go and emirates is like lifeline of dubai uh, so and emirates is probably one of the premier airlines in terms of uh, total miles flown total passengers uh, flying through it dubai airport being one of the largest airport so you can already see that's that's a massive uh, uh, massive statement out there from emirates from my lens so i track energy markets a lot and we look at jet fuel demand right jet fuel demand is normally about 9 million barrels per day that demand is already 90% down uh, as of as of now even if you look at recovery till end of the year the jet fuel demand uh, the forecasts are not it won't even uh, pick up half of the lost demand for jet fuel right so you can see the forecast for the whole airline industry and the travel industry is quite bleak at least till end of this year in terms of that if you also look at what uh, folks from different airports uh, the iata is saying uh, they do believe that this is a long term structural thing at least for next 18 to 24 months there is going to be very very uh, depressed amount of travel and i personally believe the way we travel will also fundamentally change uh, soon so right. post 9/11 uh, as you know the whole concept of security screening and you can only bring uh, one gallon of uh, products and stuff like that i think you might see a whole new uh, level of uh, policies in place which may become permanent going forward as well right 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 um you know actually what i'm actually also noticing it uh, from what you've actually shared here is i think once the businesses start to act uh, a bit more responsibly and start to feed into the ecosystem then i think the hiring and the other things which should also pick up right so why i'm sort of talking yeah. about hiring is and uh, bello can um, if i'm spelling her name right apologies if i've not spelled it right <laughs> uh, but she's saying that the forecast on hiring and um, uh, with also a question on which sectors would do more m and a at the moment so i think on the on the first uh, aspect of it uh, there are clearly some sectors so let me just jump uh, to the slide i had where we believe uh, 
so there's i think two lenses to see it right so so there are the first lens to say is which are the healthier sectors right or sectors which have done well which have been sort of i mean nobody has been resilient but which have been sort of okay coming out of this right so so stuff like food staples retail i mean people need to eat uh, we see the trend of people buying more online and buying more for uh, home cooking right so anything to do with any industry is serving those things uh, any uh, grocery stores convenience stores all these things still continue to grow right uh, of course e-commerce has been the big winner right we have seen massive jump in volumes across and you probably see news uh, across the globe right of amazon instacart and these guys hiring in thousands and thousands right so so clearly there are some sectors which will emerge stronger and structurally will change right in terms of online purchase the ratio of online to offline purchase will structurally change coming out of the covid and those sectors definitely will probably come ahead and will actually end up hiring a lot more right right on the other hand uh, sectors like energy right um and actually maybe let me just show one slide here which i skipped could be helpful here uh we had taken the same sectors which i showed in previous slide right the healthy sectors the pressured sectors and vulnerable sectors and we had looked at how many of the companies in these sectors are in distress and this also gives you a quick idea of who is not hiring right uh, or who may hire right and you can see things in dark red here right whether it's auto industry or retail transport energy i mean all these sectors are in severe distress in energy sector we are saying one third of the sector or one third of the companies have real risk of being going to bankruptcy right so 35% plus is in distress so definitely these sectors <laughs> i think hiring for them is going to be quite challenging uh, going forward right so this is probably one lens you can use to think about which sectors may hire and which sectors actually will definitely not hire coming out of this uh, this uh, situation right 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 uh i i think i have one last question before we wrap this up and i i know sure. there's still a lot more questions that are coming through okay. so i mean the excitement is still quite high that's good um you know uh, ali is asking uh, uh what's the future of consumer uh, things like amazon and uh, is the us stimulus big enough or uh, are, are these countries uh, you know that can that can print money where the downturn might downturn might be more painful because they are constrained yeah sure sure so i think there's there's two questions in there right so the first question uh, i mean e-commerce is definitely a huge winner uh, coming out of this and we've seen this shift across the world i mean there are some mature markets uh, where uh, the percentage of e-commerce was already quite high uh, but what we've seen is emerging markets where there was still a more mom and pop brick and motor economy uh, we've seen numbers almost triple in some cases of e-commerce usage right so so folks like amazon and other e-commerce companies definitely uh, gets interesting in this space i think the question is uh, how will the offerings also change right because what we've also seen is it's not about just uh, online delivery but people are also looking at different offerings right so as people go into this new trend of stay at home cook at home there is more and more uh, markets we are seeing where people are looking for two hour delivery of items uh, in some markets like singapore amazon already does amazon prime now but do we start seeing this also in other markets where you have shorter delivery time frame for some of the products right we are also seeing e-commerce companies uh, also getting more and more fresh produce um, this is something which was not there in the previous case where people used used to like to go to wet markets see look and feel the vegetables and buy uh, but i think there might be structural shifts also in these these friends and then there was a, the second question uh, on this one right and i actually forgot the second question so anand if you can <laughs> remind me about the second question here i think the second question was more related to you know whether printing money is enough oh yes yes yeah 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 i i, I think i also don't want to ignore mario but mario has an interesting question where he's uh, i mean there are actually two really good questions that i want to sort of talk about one is i think the printing money part and which countries yeah. will emerge stronger and yeah. have we seen globalization sort of dealt a permanent blow i mean we yeah. can also see like uh, trump saying that he's going to cut uh, cut off the funding to uh, who and other things so sure. do we see 
globalization really take that uh, you know more more countries are going to becoming more nationalistic so we want to protect our yeah. own stuff our own borders yeah so okay so let me let me take a uh, uh, swipe at both right so i think on the printing money uh, i mean I, I, I this is just my personal view right uh, i think people will continue to print their way out of it some countries like us which is in a good position that somebody can buy their debt can print more uh, even there as you can see there's a lot of disagreements right so they passed initial tri 3 trillion democrats passed another 3 trillion but they may have challenges going through house even there what i'm you are saying is uh, in fact yesterday uh, steve munition and uh, powell both were actually at the senate testimony and they had differing views right uh, from the fed standpoint powell feels they need to pump more money because this is the biggest recession us has seen since world war 2 uh, but steve munition from the administration standpoint says no it's going to be a fast recovery let's not push more money into the system let's wait and see how things work and then we'll push for money right, right. Um, my view is more towards what powell thinks right it, it, they probably have to push more money into the system sooner than later uh, there will be a huge contraction in q2 and they will have to kind of uh, figure out how they are actually going to help uh, this 20% plus unemployment that's going to happen right um I, I let me i think there's one last question i did want to ask because uh, yeah. One is, I think, which con uh, what actions can be taken by companies? I think this is related to the last slide mm, to increase yeah. uh, resilience, anti-fragility by Alex. But one thing that I didn't see come out of this discussion was uh, how is politics dealing with this? Because no one's actually yeah. talking about policymakers because policymakers can completely derail <laughs> countries and yeah. the global economy. And this is something that I, I mean, I'm surprised I didn't see any. And by the way, no one has actually left the meeting yet. There are still people here. So that's yeah. one of the reasons why I'm actually sort of continuing on this. We'll maybe do another five minutes and wrap this up. Sure, sure. Everyone's yeah. okay. I, it looks like no one's dropped off. So I'm assuming that they're enjoying the session. Yeah. So, so Alan, I think it's a great question, right? Absolutely. The, the biggest impact here is going to be how government maneuvers and gets people out of this, right? Uh, where we get in is we advise companies a lot. I mean, we also do advise government, uh, share scenarios and stuff, but at the end of the day, governments uh, make their own policies and stuff. And on this way, I think the jury is still out, right? Nobody knows what is the right thing to do here. Uh, it feels like the whole world is in one big experiment. Uh, so some countries believe we need to lock down, lock down really hard for a long time and then we are all okay. Some countries said no lockdown, uh, let's try uh, slowly tightening the measures and then we do things. So everyone is experimenting, right? Uh, Sweden is doing its own experiment where it's saying let's not lock down, let's continue, keep the economy going and we can somehow survive. Uh, China did the hammer approach where it was like a very rigorous lockdown and then let's rebound. Uh, Singapore was trying to balance economic impact as well as the virus outbreak. Eventually had to go to lockdown when things got offhand. So to be honest, we don't know who's going to emerge stronger yet, right? Because the whole, uh, there's so much unknown about this virus. Uh, uh, and I apologize, I'm not trying to skirt the question. But I think only maybe a year from now or two years from now, we may be able to look back uh, at how different governments, different companies react or different governments reacted and whose approach was uh, better here, right? Uh, right now, I think there is no, no single, no silver bullet on what might be the best approach to go forward. And people have to prioritize health over economy in some instances, I think. Okay. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks so much, guys. I think thank you for asking all your questions. And I hope I've actually encapsulated everybody's questions and answers. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Lenora, if you could share my slides again. So those of you who have questions, please do share them, write to us. Uh, we'll definitely get back to you with more feedback and uh, more questions. And I, we are also recording this session for those people who are actually interested in um, uh, uh, interested in sort of, uh, you know, re-listening to it and stuff like that. Uh, further to that, I'm also happy to share that uh, this webinar series is actually a continuous one. Uh, 
the whole idea of the webinar series is that we actually talk to the actual guys who are out there fighting these battles, making the changes, making the impacts. So it's not like uh, uh, an open, you know, some sort of a report and stuff like that, but just uh, people who are out there making things happen, how we are changing uh, our businesses and shaping the future businesses. So the next one is actually by, uh, hosted by Ali, uh, who's, who was the former uh, president for the Chicago alumni group. Uh, next slide. And we've actually gotten uh, the OCBC uh, a CEO to be on that, uh, on, on our uh, webinar as well. Uh, post that we have a gaming company as well as a payments company uh, CEOs uh, and uh, uh, a frontline uh, medical FMCG company that's coming up as well. So stay tuned for more. Uh, but for tonight, I thank all of you who've actually stayed back. I thank the team. I thank the uh, session. And of course, our guest speaker, Arun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you can connect with Arun on LinkedIn. Uh, please feel free to send him a message as well. Uh, otherwise, have a great evening, guys. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Anand and the whole organizing team and everyone who attended. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.